Okay. If Fletcher wasn't here, I wasn't doing it. Welcome, everybody. Um, so very happy to uh, have the opportunity to visit with you all. Um, sorry for the uh, nature of the interaction. This is obviously not how we want to do it. Uh, wearing a mask in here is not what I wanted to do, but it's where we are. Um, I'd be glad to take any questions. Uh, the the one thing I would say, the the one thing I would say unequivocally is is that we're we're glad to have the opportunity to compete. We have a young group of kids that are excited uh, to play in meaningful games. Um, at the same time, I think there are a lot of things that we're, we're dealing with that I think were unforeseen as the whole league has, has dealt with those same things. So we're going to be mindful of, of what this opportunity really is and, and try to protect our long-term future as, as well as possible. So uh, any questions you have, be glad to answer. Fletcher muted. I can't hear you. I'm sorry, David. Thank you very much. Um, I am uh, I am on two calls right now. I'm on with my news director. They're laughing at me right now. I'm trying to multitask in the Zoom world right now. Um, so thank you for, for allowing me to ask a question. First, um, going to the bubble, and, and I don't mean to start off with like such a, a harsh question here, but you are you know, uh, a cancer survivor. Will, will, will you be going to the bubble? Will all your players be going to the bubble? Will Alvin Gentry? Has that been finalized and or decided yet as you all get back and start moving forward with that process? Well, from my perspective, I will be going. Uh, I'm almost 10 years out from uh, my experience from a chemo standpoint, and I am I am not at all in a, in a high-risk area, and I'm not going to ask my players to do anything I wouldn't do if – if they have to go survive the quarantine and we're going to battle like we are, then I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, from the standpoint of Alvin and our players, that's to be determined. Uh, when we turn our roster in, we may, may or may not have to make replacements even once that roster is ten, turned in on the first. Uh, we're sort of at the mercy of the virus in that regard. But uh, we have no reason to believe at this moment that anyone will not go. Um, and we'll just work from there. What were some of the biggest challenges of just trying to do all this, put this together? Well, I think the league really was was the group that was challenged more than more than we were. To a, to a huge degree, we were um, reacting to everything that we were hearing from from uh, the media in terms of how this was going to happen. You know, Alvin Gentry's on several committees, as am I, and the league has been good about trying to get our input throughout this process. But ultimately, the amount of work that's been done on the league level to bring this to fruition is is mind numbing and I'm, I'm grateful they've been willing to do it um, Adam Silver and his staff just remarkable in terms of both work rate and uh, decision making so again we're we're grateful we're part of a league that's led by that group of people and we trust in what they're doing I know different players have had different access to gyms and workout equipment and things like that but do you guys feel like they have this month is enough time to kind of get in shape and get ready for the season coming up? Truthfully, probably not. Um, and, and I think a lot of it has to do with just the nature of the month itself. So this first week in our buildings, we're not allowed to do anything really other than one on none. Uh, you won't see us being allowed to do two on two, three on three and ramp up towards five on five. So we're gonna have to simulate as much movement and activity and exploding into your shot and doing as many things as we can from a tendon and ligament strengthening standpoint. Uh, Aaron Nelson and his team are going to be very challenged by this. From a sports science standpoint, league-wide, I think that's going to be the biggest challenge. I think COVID is not what I'm concerned with. It's really more about long-term injury possibilities. And I think the whole league is dealing with the same thing. But to me, that's really where the challenge lies is how do you, while battling COVID and not bringing guys together in our building, get them ready to play full speed and so that'll be that'll be a delicate balance and i'm i'm grateful that we have uh, aaron nelson here to lead us through that what would you say are the other various elements of the setup that might put more of a premium on depth than there otherwise would be be it the compressed schedule of games the possibility of a player being ruled out for testing and so forth and the stuff you just mentioned i'm sorry i lost the first part of your question 
Uh, what, what are the elements of the setup going forward, you know, once the schedule starts, that might put even more of a premium on depth, roster depth, than there normally would be? Well, I think the, the fact that we have three scrimmages in week three um, that are going to be full games, essentially, uh, that's, I think, one of the big challenges. Because in order to be ready in week three, um, to actually play games, you're, you're not really going to want to give too many people too many minutes. So you're going to spread that out as mon- uh, amongst as much of your roster as you, you possibly can. I'm, I'm grateful the league let us bring both two ways by way of example so that we could have more depth. Um, I'm, I'm grateful that they're allowing for COVID replacements in the format that they are. It will enable you to have, quote, enough bodies. Um, and we're blessed that I think we'll have all of the right ones as well. So from that standpoint, we're, we're in a good position. Um, but depth is going to be at a premium for everyone. And unfortunately for us, our first two games are our hardest opponents in terms of winning percentage against. Now, I would argue that because of the quarantine and everybody else facing the same challenges, results are going to be more random than they would have been otherwise. I, I think it's going to be Um, sort of you're going to be totally at the mercy of when you meet your good opponents. So the fact that our first two opponents are very, very difficult games and we're three and a half out with eight to go instead of three and a half with 18 to go, um, you know, we've got to hit the ground running. So that puts a great deal of stress on the, on the depth of the team. Hey, Griff, uh, you know, everyone who who goes to Florida is going to basically be away from their family for a minimum of five weeks. What are, what are just the conversations with the players like about that, particularly the guys who you know might have young children? Yeah, so we've got a group that's been really, really excited about playing. Um, Drew and Lauren, I think, view this as an opportunity for Drew. Um, and I think we, we have J.J. Redick in the same situation with he and Chelsea. They, they view this as an opportunity. It's a platform that I think our players are, are relishing in terms of uh, making a statement about social injustice. I, I think Black Lives Matter is going to be a platform the league very much embraces, and our players embrace that as well. But let's not kid ourselves. I mean, this quarantine situation is going to be difficult. It's it's going to be a, a war of attrition to a huge degree from a mental standpoint, and, and we want to be the team that's most well-suited to take advantage of that. And so what we're asking our players to do is please don't participate in this unless you can do it mind, body, and spirit with every fiber of who you are. Because once we get there, this isn't going to be something that's, that's designed for the week. This is going to be about mental toughness, and we don't want you there if you don't want to be there. And I, I think, fortunately, we're blessed. Everybody's excited about taking part. Hey, you said you put together um, the restart schedule. Just given the, the schedule that you guys, before the virus hit, had remaining, was obviously the easiest remaining in the league. Is that something that you are kind of lobbying for with Silver when, when the restart schedule is being put together or having to remind them of? Or is is that not a conversation that you really have to have? They, maybe they take that into account on their own. Well, I think they, I think they very much uh, took, took it into account on their own in terms of strength of schedule and trying to be equitable. At the same time, there's only so much you can do. I mean, giving us Utah and the Clippers back to back to start because they were the next games we would have played, I, I guess makes some sense logically. But what it effectively did was it put us in a position where instead of having two games out of 18 against Western Conference playoff teams that were not Memphis, we now have two and eight games. So it doesn't matter to me what our winning percentage of the teams we're playing is because again, it's you have no idea. we. By the time we play games, we'll be off 15 weeks. That's longer than the previous off season. So to think that we're going to be the same teams we were heading into that is almost um, naive. I, I think what we really are is we're playing two really important playoff teams to start. And whereas we had an 18-game cushion before, we only have eight. And, and the league had to be mindful of that with everyone. So th- to, to many in many different ways, this is a sum of several imperfect solutions, and we just have to be about big picture and league oriented. And it's not about us; it's it's about the group as a whole. You mentioned how um, you know grateful you are to just to have the opportunity to participate in this, and you you just talked about some of the veteran guys that 
the opportunity that they're they're going to have. How excited are you for just some of the younger guys to be able to play on this stage? And there's several young players on this team, including Bi, who haven't been in the playoffs before. Just what's your excitement level for the, those guys to just have this opportunity to, to play here? Well, again, you guys have have heard me say this in the past. We wanted to play. The mark of success for us was going to be to play meaningful games in March and April. And, and this is now going to be meaningful games in July and August, but we're going to get to do that. And that was important to us, and it's because of our young core. It's because of the experience those guys will get in sort of the crucible of competition. That's a positive for us. It's a, it's a blessing. I don't know that I would use the word excited relative to that part of it because it's so incredibly different versus what it would have been. But I'm really grateful that they're going to have the opportunity to play in those minutes. It's just it's going to look a little different than it may have looked if it came in the natural flow of the season. But I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll uh, be in a position to compete throughout those eight games. It really sets up in a difficult way if you're not in position to continue that, and we'll just have to deal with it as it comes. David, are you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Hey, Griff, I know you guys uh, emphasize mental health even before any of this stuff popped up, so how important is that going to be going into the bubble, making sure all the guys are right you know, as far as their mental health? No, I think it's critical, and it's going to be really essential. And Jenna Rosen's done a really good job throughout this period during the pandemic of Zooming with players, doing individual meetings, doing team meetings, etc. We're going to make that a focus of what we do. It's going to be a built-in part of our practice time. Literally every day that we practice in the bubble, we will have mental preparedness. We will work through mindfulness training with Jenna literally every day because it's, it's paramount to our success there. Again, when, when I said this is going to be about who wants to be there more, it's going to be about who can keep themselves in, in the best frame of mind, quite frankly, and to stay on task and to not think about the enormity of what's going on. And so we're going to invest a great deal of our time and energy in that side of things. I know, I'm sorry. Sorry. I know that obviously mental fortitude will be tested here by all teams and, you know, maybe the team that comes away with it is the most, you know, mentally, you know, tough. As far as the physical testing goes, how has that process gone for, for you all? Because I know are you testing every day? How often are you testing the players? In, in, have you had anybody? I know a report with the Nets yesterday, players tested positive. Have you all dealt with anything yet that would you, you would look at as a setback or anything that would be newsworthy? Yeah, so the league has done, uh, has mandated that you do testing every other day in market. Uh, we are using a testing protocol that the league arranged for. Um, and, and the day everyone came back to market around the league, everyone knew there were going to be several positive tests. And it's why the league put in as much time as they did between report date and mandatory workouts because they wanted to catch those as early as possible. Unfortunately, as a play-in team, we're sort of disproportionately penalized if we have a COVID case because by the time you get players back, you may already be done. Um, and your competitive advantage may be gone. So in our situation, COVID is going to play a much bigger role than it will for an established playoff team. To this point, we have had positive tests. Um, from a HIPAA standpoint, I'm not going to talk about any of those individuals. The league has a system in place that was designed to catch these cases. Uh, that system worked, and, and we're just going to deal with it the best we can moving forward. But from a, from a basketball standpoint, I think you're going to see COVID have an enormous impact on teams. And even some of the teams that went into the bubble as a playoff seed, you've seen that Brooklyn has been really damaged by uh, the COVID situation. So again, this is something where we're all at the mercy of the same enemy. I think it'd be just for this, if I didn't follow up, you said you had, I did hear that correctly, you have had positive cases? We have, we've had multiple players test positive uh, the very first day. We've had none since. Um, and we are dealing with those as we as we go along. Can you say how many? Three. So, Griff, what's the protocol now? Those players are all in quarantine. They're not in quote quarantine. Um, they're in isolation. They're in self isolation, and they test daily. And when they can have two negative tests, or rather tests that are good results for us, um, they can return to activity with the team. Um, the league is relying both on the CDC 
and their own uh, medical experts and the players union medical experts in this and and we're going to continue to follow those guidelines and as i said the the program they had in place they knew they were going to have positive tests and, and we're dealing with them in exactly the manner they anticipated we'd have to Let's, let's cut to the chase here. What, what kind of shape is Zion in? So, you know, it's a, a good question, and I appreciate it. I, I would say that I could give you the same answer on Zion I can give you on virtually everyone. I, I have no idea. Um, they're not able to do anything here that smacks of basketball, um, and all of the workouts right now are voluntary. Um, so I can tell you he is handling the ball awfully well, and his shooting looks great. Um, in terms of his preparedness and fitness for basketball, I, I can't give you any indication of that at all. I really have no idea. Hey, David, Mark McGee here, USA Today. I hope you and yours have been uh, hanging in there as best as you guys can. Um, so to follow up on that whole point, you know, get all the restrictions everyone's been going through, what have been your takeaways from Zion and the rest of the guys of just how they've handled this uh, deal of cards here? Well, I mean, again, because we had everyone show up on the date they were supposed to because everyone has indicated a desire to play, I'm, I'm going to assume that they've been keeping themselves ready to do that. Um, we had a group, again, that was um, very, very overwhelmingly excited about the opportunity to play. So I think many of them have kept themselves in really good shape. But again, it's just almost impossible to know until we can get up and down. Next, once the mandatory workouts begin, they're still limited to having eight at a time in the gym, one per basket, two in the weight room, two in the training room. This isn't going to look anything like basketball for quite a while. So we're going to do as, do as much as we possibly can to get the group ready to go. But at the same time, we feel like we're protecting perhaps as bright a future as there is in the league, and we're going to be mindful of that as well. David, recently Doc Rivers talked about how difficult it was to deciding on the exact members of the traveling party to Orlando. Have you found something similar to deciding whether an additional coach goes, maybe a physical trainer, maybe even like Jenna Rosen? How difficult has that been for you? And have you decided on a final traveling party to Orlando? You know, our, our traveling party is, is impacted by so many things that it's been really difficult to settle on. Uh, once you have positive cases, that impacts what your party could look like. Um, obviously, the situation that's ongoing from a coaching perspective can have some bearing on that. So, no, we, we've not nailed very much down yet. Um, I, I think we have a core group that, that are a given to go. Um, myself and Trajan will be attending. Um, and, and beyond that, I would say that everything else has been pretty fluid for us. Um, I, I can't say that it's a difficult situation. It's just one that everyone around the league is dealing with. You know, it's. It's the same for everyone, so I don't want to make it seem like our situation's any worse, but certainly in this in the situation we're in relative to the coaching uncertainty, that that hurts us. Hey, Griff, I saw um, JJ on, on Sports Journal last night talk a little bit about you know the league highlighting racial injustice. They're going to put Black Lives Matter in the back of jerseys. You said that's great, but but what we need is real change. Just in your view. Um, what are your thoughts on just what, what real change could look like at this moment? You know, it's a good question, Christian, and I think what real change is going to look like is that we start to tang chan sorry, tangibly change our justice system, tangibly change the way in which we approach voting rights. I think even right now there are states that are doing the complete opposite of what you hope they would be doing in terms of making voting an equitable situation across all socioeconomic lines and all racial lines. And I see this country not doing that in, in a large number uh, around the country. And that concerns me. It concerns our players as well. Um, the bubble provides a platform to make sure the conversations keep happening. But the goal of the conversations is to actually take action. And, and our belief is that until we're doing that on a consistent basis, the, the talk is just talk. And I'm really grateful that JJ and Lonzo, our Players Alliance that are, is working hand in hand with the, the Saints organization, is working to figure out exactly where we're going to put our energy and our efforts and not where we're going to put our, our sort of linguistic skills. After a while, you don't need to talk about how dangerous this has been and how vile racism is. You need to start to effectively change it on a, on a grassroots level. And so I hope that's what comes out of this. 
Griff, what, what's it been like for you kind of seeing some of the players like JJ, like Derek, use their voice and get involved in, in some of these movements over the past few weeks? Well, it's been, it's been really good for me just because as a white male, I, I feel uh, very similar to, to how JJ feels, and he's expressed some of, some of it incredibly well. His appearance on Scott Van Pelt last night was tremendous. Um, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon us, really, to, to be the ones that are going to change this. Nothing's going to change until white males decide that this has to change. And it's been unjust and incorrect for 400 years. And until we actually start to recognize the ways in which we've had privilege and start to accept ourselves that that's not acceptable and we're not willing to live our lives like that, it's not going to change. So for me, getting to see JJ make that statement openly and for um, Brandon Ingram and, and Lonzo Ball and Drew to be as mindful as they are of, of raising these issues, it just helps me. I need to listen to that and I need to have empathy for that and I would tell you I always did but I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't spring into action previously and I don't think any of us did and and this has been a blessing for us because I think everyone now is is dealing with this with a much greater sense of urgency. Uh, Griff, on a, on a basketball note, how, uh, how difficult has it been trying to judge what I guess the market could be uh, whenever we do get to an offseason for guys like Brandon Ingram and Lonzo Ball when it comes to uh, the potential extensions and, and just trying to figure out what all that is going to look like cap space-wise? Yeah, again, it's it's been challenging, but it's similarly challenging for the whole league, not knowing what the salary cap's going to be by way of example. Um, those things are challenging. Not knowing when the following season starts or ends is going to be a challenge for everyone. So I think as you're building your team, you're going to have a very short turnaround. You're not going to have a lot of time with the data in terms of what the cap numbers really are. So you're going to have to make decisions very quickly. What that's done for Shane Kupperman and our, our salary cap team here is, has been to run every single scenario. Shane and Mike Blackstone and our team there, Mark Chazanov, they've been literally preparing a scenario for virtually every outcome with what the cap might look like and what that means we would then be um, anticipating paying our free agents and guys that we want to extend. So it's a challenge, but it's a challenge for everybody. Do you feel like some of it, uh, it kind of shrinks what teams can do on the outside if, if the cap is going down in terms of the movement that you think you'll see this year? It does to some degree. I mean, intellectually, you would believe that that's true, that if there's uh, less financial bandwidth and flexibility, that, that that precludes teams from outside your organization making a run at people. But at the same time, it only takes one. And you never know how people are going to allocate their resources. And I, I think we're looking at this from the standpoint of we believe very strongly both Lonzo and Brandon want to be part of the future here. And we anticipate that that happens. And we're going to continue to work from that that vantage point because they've been very, very clear in their desires to continue their careers here. Hey, Griff, you would just, because of the unusual nature, the unprecedented nature of this eight-game basically play-in situation, how much discussion are you and Alvin and the staff having about this strategy? I mean, you talked about hitting the ground running. Uh, are you viewing it basically as a do or die every game? Uh, situation or you know you're talking strategy long term because I know you talked at length about your concern really is 2021 and beyond because of the future you have with this team but can you talk a little bit about the strategy involved in this unusual kind of tournament yeah I think mostly it's been about the strategy of how do we get everybody as ready to play in as good a condition as possible for those first three games I mean those are really those are going to dictate our outcome so once you get past that, the whole strategy changes. But for those first three games, everything's been about how do we put ourselves in the best position to compete and to be healthy and to be healthy long term coming out of it. You know, nobody really in our operation is concerned with COVID as much as we are just the long term health and viability of our franchise. And, and that's really what we've been looking at. And those three games are the three games we need to be ready to play right from jump. And how do we achieve that? And that's been as much with Alvin and, and the coaching staff as it has been with Aaron Nelson and the medical team. Griff, do you anticipate anything happening in the bubble and maybe even the playoffs that could change perhaps your approach to free agency or, or personnel decisions? Or do you feel like you're pretty good on where you're at with, with regards 
the plan going forward? I think we have a good feel for, for what our roster needs moving forward regardless. To some degree, I, I hope that the bubble doesn't become fool's gold, that you don't buy into something that maybe isn't realistic. Again, I, you have to go into the bubble understanding that, by and large, it's, it's going to create some randomness and the variability of who's healthy at any given time on the opposing team and who's playing who minutes and those types of things will have a huge bearing on, on, out, on outcome. And, and for that reason, I think you have to, it's almost like when you scout and you look at the NCAA tournament and you try to take it with a grain of salt when a guy gets crazy hot in the tournament, you have to do the same thing, I think, in this bubble situation and rely on the data that you had. You know, we were, we were fortunate because we ran all the encore presentations. I got to watch our team in a totally non-emotional time. And, and watching film in addition to that throughout this period of time. In a non-emotional way, when you look at our roster and you make determinations about what we are and what we need to be, it's a much better way to make decisions than to go in the bubble, deal with everything we're gonna deal about in the bubble and then try to make decisions off of that. So I would tell you that I, I don't think we're gonna put a lot of stock in that in terms of dictating our long-term future. It seems like some of this is Malika, it seems like some of that So we had this discussion yesterday, in fact, and we've talked about it throughout the, the quarantine period, but we had the conversation yesterday that we need to be living our lives basically from yesterday on as though we're already in the bubble. We need to go from the gym to the house, make sure that we're eating well, doing the right things away from the game, and carry ourselves as though we're already there. And again, I think we have players that are committed enough to outcome that they're gonna do that. When I'm talking about the randomness, Malika, I'm not referring to COVID as much as I am everything else that comes with this. Mental toughness, whether or not you play a team that has any reason to play their starters at the right time. If you look at the teams that got schedules that might look more difficult, if they're playing the best teams they play at the end of their schedule, well, there's a good chance that those teams don't have any reason to play their best players. So you're catching them at a good time. We're playing our best teams at the beginning. So that's not necessarily a good time. And, and you don't know whether or not those teams are going to play the initial games as though they're trying to win, or are they going to play as though they're just ramping up over a period of time? You have no idea what that looks like, but it's certainly not going to be traditional regular season basketball in that same rhythm and flow. So when I'm talking about randomness, I'm really talking about the, the overall nature of the experience for everyone being totally alien to what a season normally looks like. Well, I was aware of that story before it ran. I thought Lauren did a remarkable job in the way she presented it and the way she shared that. Um, I was grateful that she did it. Um, I had heard that previously. It's something that we talk about often as, as, a, as a team, frankly. And, and since everything has come about, we've certainly talked more. But that's something that we've, we've listened to players on throughout. Uh, during my time in my NBA career, it's, it's not the first time it's happened that I've heard that story, and unfortunately, it's not going to be the last. And, and I, I think we need to continue to act in such a way that it becomes the last. You know, our players are no different than society as, as a whole. And if you can't feel safe as an African American in this country when you get pulled over by the police, until that changes, we can't feel like we've achieved anything. And, I was grateful that Lauren sh shared that story because Drew is somebody who is very recognizable and wherever he was, I'm sure they recognized he was a professional athlete, but it's not one of those things for me where I think it's, it's significant 
that it happened. Unfortunately, it's very common that it happens. What's significant is that more people share those stories so we can hear them and react to them and start to deal with it. My last thought for you, if I could ask just one more question. What do you think about this um, seeding of the playoff format being based on win percentage? I mean, it obviously eliminates uh, some of the head-to-head -head wins that you guys have had over teams in the regular season, but do you feel like that was kind of the best-case scenario? Yeah, I mean, again, sure. For us, we got pretty heavily penalized because we beat Portland four times, and if we have the same winning percentage, or if they have a higher winning percentage, they're going to get the nod if we were in a, a quote, tiebreaker situation. That's disappointing, but again, we're, we're not the only team that got adversely affected by that. But I would, I would tell you that part of it is certainly more germane to us than some of the other things because it's it's complicated to beat somebody four times and be told you're not getting a playoff spot. So in that way, it's again, that's more of the randomness I'm talking about. That obviously wouldn't happen a traditional NBA season, and it wasn't intentional on the league's part. They're, they're dealing with the best they can of imperfect solutions. Do you want to have any more questions for Griff? Rip, how would you feel about the league making a permanent shift to like a December start time moving forward with this? Who asked that question? I'm sorry, you didn't pop up on the screen. Oh, it's uh, Mark Menard, WWL. Hey, Mark. Um, yeah, so we would very much support that. Obviously, uh, being part of an organization with the Saints and, and having these discussions with Mickey and Sean and everybody on the business side, Dennis and Mrs. Benson, it would certainly be a positive for us to start later because this is a football town first. Um, and if we're going to really take a foothold in the market, starting later gives us an opportunity to, to start in a setting where all eyes are on us. So we would certainly support that as a franchise. And I know several teams around the league have pushed that agenda throughout this. So if it ended up being something that was permanently the case, we would absolutely feel grateful for that. Great. Thank you very much, Griff. Uh, if everyone can just stand by for a couple minutes, we're going to get Coach Gentry in on the call. Thank you, guys. Be well. Stay healthy. Thank you, David. Thank you.